All right, everybody, we should make a start. Um, very warm welcome. Um, guess if we're, we're our guest speaker tonight. Um, so it's uh, right. So, Brother Warwick has asked that we open with a reading, and that will be from Romans chapter 5, verses 15 to 27. Yeah, well, it's nice to be with you all. Now, in the reading that we just had, we're not going to give an exposition of Romans chapter 5, but it said that Adam was a figure of him that was to come. And we know that it's not the only place in the New Testament we're told that. So Adam pointed forward to Christ. Well, to say in Romans 5, the idea was that he was a federal head of those that were all born into and we, we come into the new family, family of Christ, as the new head. And Adam was the first of the literal creation, and Christ is the head of the new creation, and so on. And we will see, as we go through tonight, that there are a lot of parallels whereby the Scriptures make Adam and Christ similar. Of course, no one can be so similar to Christ because he's the incomparable Son of God. So every type breaks down. You'll hear people say that probably the most complete type of Christ in the Old Testament might have been Joseph, for example. And we can find so many parallels there in the life of Joseph. But what I'm going to put to you tonight, and this series is taken from Hebrews 7 verse 3, and we'll get there in a moment. Uh, in fact, we might as well go there as this next slide. So if someone would like to read Hebrews 7 and 3, and I want it interactive. Off the screen? Off the screen, doesn't matter, as long as they speak loud. We're off the screen, are we? Oh, it's not, is it there? Have I got it there on the screen? I've only got the reference, I haven't got the verse typed out. Oh, hang on. Hang on. Hebrews 7 verse 3 reads, Without father, without mother, without descent, having neither the beginning of days nor end of life, but made like unto the Son of God, abideth the priest continually. This is about Melchizedek. And there's about three or four chapters running right through Hebrews where he shows in what way Melchizedek was a type of the Son of God. And I'll say that every character in the Old Testament and the New but particularly the old, because it was written to tell us about Christ. Uh, Romans 15 verse 4 says, Whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning and comfort, that we through hope and comfort of the Scriptures might have hope. And then the fifth verse of Romans 15 says, I want you to be like-minded according to the Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, the Scripture was written with Christ in mind. There is no part of the Bible that we can't find the Lord Jesus Christ. He's there on every page. And how do we prove that? Well, we can have a whole night proving that by going to Psalm 40, verses 5 to 8, and looking at Hebrews chapter 10, and a similar range of verses where the whole section of Psalm 40 is brought out. And we may even have a, well, I've got, I've got that down at the bottom of this quotation, so... I don't stick to my notes and you'll find me rambling and raving, so that's all right. Yeah, so um, now let's just go to the next quote. First Peter, I'll stick to my notes tonight. First Peter 1, verses 10 and 11. And the next reader, well, like it's just someone volunteering, you can read those. Another, I'll read it. Good. First Peter 1, 10, 11. Of which salvation <laughs> the prophets have inquired and searched diligently, who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you, searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ, which was in them, did signify, when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. So Peter is telling us that the prophets were wanting to find out about Messiah and they didn't quite understand the fullness of the sufferings and the glory that would follow, but they were trying to, and the Spirit of Christ was in there, and the Spirit of Christ was in the teaching of the inspiration of the Old Testament. Now let's read Hebrews 10, verses 5 to 9, next quote. We'll get on to Adam shortly. Thanks, Robin. 
Consequently, when Christ came into the world, he said, Sacrifices and offerings you have not desired, but a body have you prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sin offerings you have taken no pleasure. Then, then I said, Then I said, Behold, I have come to do your will, O God, as it is written in me in the scroll of the book. When he said above, you have neither desired nor taken pleasure in sacrifices and offerings, but burnt offerings and sin offerings. These are offered according to the law. Then he added, Behold, I have come to do your will. He does away with the first in order to establish the second. I guess that word volume in the AV or scroll is in Robin's translation. You can see on the transparency, it means the knob around which the scroll has been rolled. In other words, you can't unravel the Bible because they were all written around a wooden stick that unraveled the Bible. So without you understanding Christ, if the writer of the Hebrews be it Paul or someone else, I believe it was Paul, but there are those that have strong views other way. And one of my good friends would suggest that it was Priscilla as an Aquila and Priscilla. And but I won't mention his name. And look, I've got a nod up the back. He knows who I'm talking about, Jeremy, don't you? Maybe, maybe not. Yeah, well, anyway, Pris I wouldn't suggest it was Priscilla, or otherwise she might get a big head. <laughs> but certainly not this Priscilla. But anyway, no, I believe it's Paul. But the point is, he's saying the whole book can only be unraveled through the understanding of Christ. Now, we're not going to turn to Revelation 5, verse 2 to 5, but we've got John weeping because no one on earth was able to unravel the scroll. And the angel said, don't weep because the line of the tribe of Judah has prevailed and he is worthy to unroll the scroll, okay? No man on earth was able to do so, but about Christ he was able to do so. So it's just supporting the same. And who, who gave the book of Revelation? Who wrote the book of Revelation? Jesus, Jesus Christ himself. So he is confirming the words that the writer of the Hebrews has said. Now, Hebrews is a quote from the Septuagint version, which is LXX, is the thing. These were the 70 people who wrote the Greek translation of the Old Testament in Alexandria. And they wrote it from Psalm 40, verses 6 to 8. So I will get my next reader to read Psalm 40, verses 6 to 8. If you're worried we're spending too long before we're getting into Adam, Adam it won't take long. But this is the preliminary to the whole series. Psalm 40, verse 6 to 8. Yep. <laughs> Sacrifice and offering thou didst not desire, mine ears hast thou opened. Burnt offering and sin offering thou hast not required. Then said I love, I come. In the volume of the book it is written of me. I delight to do thy will, O my God, yea, thy law is within my heart. Now, so the word that's used there for volume is quite different in the Hebrew than the Septuagint translation. But there's no contradiction between them because they are complementary. One saying on every page of the scroll, well, they didn't have pages, it was just sections. Every segment of the scroll you will find crossed. And the other one says, and without Christ, you won't have been un unable to unravel and read the scroll. So I think we can just read what's up on the overhead there, and for the sake of the audience, I'll just read it out. The volume, word volume means there, the scroll itself. David's inference is that Christ is the central theme of the book. Now, in 2 Samuel 23, verses 1 to 4, would someone read that out? Because this is going to establish exactly the same point. I'll have another go. Thank you. Now, these be the last words of David. David, the son of Jesse, said, And the man who was raised up on high, the anointed of the God of Jacob, and the sweet son of Israel said, The spirit of Yahweh spake by me, and his word was in my tongue. And the God of Israel said, The rock of Israel spake to me, 
He that ruleth over men must be just, ruling in the fear of God. And he shall be as the light of the morning, when the sun riseth, even a morning without clouds, as the tender grass springing out of the earth by clear shining after rain. Oh, he can go on and he's saying about the crucifixion of Christ, the man that's going to deal with the sons of Belial will have to be fenced with iron, and etc. And David says, he's not talking about my immediate descendants. They're not the one he's talking about. He's talking about Messiah, the Son of God. And so here... Um, Brother Thomas translates 2 Samuel 23, the sweetest theme of Israel's psalms. So he's saying, go to the psalms, you won't find the psalm when it's talking about the ways of the righteous, it's not about Christ. Of course, it's condemning the wicked and he's not there, but in all the themes on every page of the Bible, we're being told in these passages that we look to that without Christ, you haven't got a Bible. All right? So we come to the next one. We come to our subject. We read Romans 5, <laughs> verses uh, 12 to 21. And the Greek word for um, is the figure, is the word type. It's a comparison. So Adam and Christ are compared. We've already suggested ways in which they're compared. They're the head of two families. Naturally, we're born into Adam. Naturally, we're part of the first creation, the creation that God created. But in Christ, we have a changed status. We take on a new family and we're part of the new creation. Now, that theme goes right throughout the, uh, the New Testament. You'll find it in Colossians, you'll find it in 1 Corinthians, you'll find it everywhere. I'm not going to go any further on that. So we read now 1 Corinthians 15, verses 45 to 49. Yep. Thank so you. It, and so it is written, the first man Adam was made of the soul, the last Adam was made of quickening spirit. Howbeit that was not first which is spiritual, that which is natural, and afterward that which is spiritual. First man is of the earth, earthly, second man is the Lord of heaven. As is the earthly, such are they also the earth. And as is, as is the heavenly, such are they also the heaven. And as we have borne the image of the shall also bear the image of Okay, it's, it's deep language, but it's also quite easy to understand, isn't it? Adam, Genesis 1, verse 26, was made in the image and likeness of God, Elohim. And when we come over to the genealogy in Luke, it goes right through and it finishes up, which was the son of Adam, which was the son of God. So Adam was the son of God, and in that sense, he's also typical of Jesus, who was the son of God. Adam was son of God by creation. Jesus was son of God by begetting, in a higher sense. Now, we're not, our subject isn't to go into to discuss what the divine begetting bestowed upon the Lord Jesus Christ, but to show that Adam was made, and the uh, here he was the first. And we can use this passage; we can prove that the Lord Jesus Christ did not pre-exist, because it says first that which is natural, then that which is spiritual. So all those people that say that Jesus was the spiritual Son of God or the third part of the Trinity, and then he became incarnated upon the earth, Paul says, no, no. Adam was before Christ because first was the natural, then was the spiritual. Christ is made a life-giving spirit, <coughs> but before that he was like Adam, a flesh-breathing soul, as, as each one of us is. We don't need any more on that particular one, so let's go to the next one. Okay. Now, we, we take it up. We've looked at Genesis 1. Someone can read just from the screen. Verses 26 to 28. And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the flesh of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image, in the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. 
For God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply, and replenish the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, and the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. And you see a whole host of quotations down at the bottom of the screen there, which all draw their meaning from this passage here in Genesis 1, verses 26 to 28. So we, we'll just go a little bit out of left field. When the Lord Jesus Christ, in the time of his temptation, they asked, he, uh, they said, is it lawful to pay tribute unto Caesar or not? He said, well, show me a denarius. He said, um, you tell me whose is the image there? Oh, that's Caesar's. He said, well, you give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar, but you give to God what belongs to God. So the other side of the coin in argument was, well, whose image and likeness are we made in? Oh, God's. So what do we give to God? Oh, Caesar can have our money, but God owns our life. We give God service and everything else other than our, well, even in our material things we do, but we, we pay our taxes. But we are made in the image and likeness of God. And here we have the purpose of God in this quotation. God intended that the man he created have dominion over all flesh. How do we know that that's the case? Well, we... We, we could go to Psalm 8, for example. Our Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. And Psalm 8 is based upon the genesis of creation. All creation, fowls, fish, all the earth will be under the feet of the Son of Man, Son of Adam. So it's a title of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of Man. Which gospel record do we find that particularly in? I'm going to put one back to you and get you thinking so you're not listening to me all the time. Luke. Very good. <laughs> Luke. Yeah. And in the um, Old Testament, we have one of the prophets. We have, because the four gospel records are the, uh, the lion, the ox, the Man and the eagle, the four faces of the Caribbean, and they correspond to Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Daniel. So in the same order. So Luke corresponds with the third of the major prophets, which is Ezekiel. What was Ezekiel's title? Son of Man. And in that, he typified the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? And so we might deal with that, we may not. But um, and with 1 Corinthians 15, we will read this one because see the word every that I, and all that are repeated there in Genesis 1, verse 26. You read uh, 1 Corinthians uh, 15 and verses 21 to 28. Next, Trey, you could read that. Come on, Fran, you're very, very quiet in the corner over there. I'm trying to support you. Thank you. <laughs> 21 to 28? Yep. Go. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. But every man in his own order, Christ the first fruits, afterward they that are Christ at his coming. Then comes the end when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power. For Christ must reign until God has put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. For God has put all thing, things under Christ's feet. But when he says all things are put under him, it is manifest that God is accepted which did put all things under Christ's feet. And when all things shall be subdued under Christ, then shall the Son also himself be subject unto God that put all things under him, that God may be all and ill. That's a reference to Genesis 1, 26 to 28, isn't it? So God's purpose is stated there, and in, in and through Christ, all creation will be subjected to Christ, and that having been achieved, Christ will be subjected to God, that God's purpose 
which we could say is uh, stated five times in the Old Testament. First time that we know of is, we could, we could have included Genesis 1, couldn't we? But Isaiah, Numbers 14, 21, Isaiah 6, Isaiah 65, Habakkuk 2, and 14, yeah. And uh, the last one just escaped me for the moment. That, uh, Was it Micah? Well, no, uh, I don't think so. But it could be, you could be right. Anyway, um, now let's read Hebrews 2, verses 5 to 11, and we'll see how the writer to the Hebrews, be it the Apostle Paul or perhaps someone else, picks up the same thing. Uh, someone can read verses 5 to 11. Following the angels that were not put in subjection in the world to come, whereof they speak, but one in a certain place stepped by saying, What is man that thou art mindful of him? For the Son of Man, they may descend a little lower than the angels, their crowns be glory and honour, and did set him backward. Thou hast put all things in subjection under his feet. For in that he put all in subjection of it. He had nothing that is not. But now he's all that he Exactly the same message, isn't it? We're finding time and time again. Now, all things in the Greek, I'm saying this for Barry and Joan, they remember an old member that Riverwood a long, long time ago used to say, Now that is our panter in the Greek. <laughs> all things. Because pan means everything, tar pan, the all things. Now, in case you're wondering who that was, that was Ted Spunberg. Doesn't matter. Next, reader can read Colossians 1, verses 13 to 22, and you'll find exactly the same. Look, got to create quite a bit of Greek because there has got a bit of Greek in it. Well, that's how loving translates the all things. That's exactly right. That's correct. And by the way, I welcome interaction. Anyone interrupting, questioning, anything, just got to keep an eye on the time. It's very hard to tell where the hands are. So I'll use that as an excuse to on that call. Uh, half past. It's an hour past. Oh, look, I thought it was speaking for too long. <laughs> Some people think that's the case. You don't have to give all things in one night. Um, yeah, yeah, Colossians 1, 30 to 22, next reader. Yep, who has delivered us from the power of darkness and translated us to the kingdom of his kingdom, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the best of sins, who is the image of the invisible for by him the authors that are in him, this is the way, but they grow the reality of the creation of God. Okay, so it's that message, isn't it? Put it over and over again. And what it's telling us that naturally we are in Adam and that qualifies no benefits upon us, confers no benefits. But in Christ, we're part of the new creation. It doesn't, in fact, it proves the very reverse as we're going through all these quotes to a pre-existence, anything else, doesn't it? First to natural, that's why you go to Corinthians, then that which is spiritual. Yes, Jeremy. It is remarkable, though, that even though first the natural, then the spiritual, once Jesus comes along, we know he's 
you know, the everlasting Father, the Father of eternity, as that's right. translates it, um, is creation, spiritual creation though it be, almost becomes retrospective and covers right back to creation. Well, John 1 will tell us that. Yeah, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And, of course, it's taking us back to Genesis 1, and it's saying when God created the world, he wasn't creating a physical abode for human beings like Adam. He was creating it for Christ and the new creation that would come later in point of time, but the plan revolved and centred around the cross. And without the cross, there was no plan. And it's also remarkable in that verse 16, by him were the all things created. Yeah. The all things that he had to subdue, he ends up being the creator of all things that he subdues. Yeah. Now, let's go to the next slide. And we're just saying God created Adam to have dominion over all things. That's where we started in Genesis 1.26. Now, Psalm 8 has its... Uh, superscription in Psalm 9. If you want to understand the titles to the psalm, you've got to get a little book called uh, J.W. Thir um Names and Titles. Names and Titles, yeah. Titles. Of the psalms, titles of the psalms. And the what's written above Psalm 9 in our authorised version is upon Muth Labin, which Muth or Moth is the word for death, and Laban champion, so the death of the champion. So Psalm 8 was written by David to ascribe the victory over Goliath. So it's Christ's victory over the giant that was we all were in fear of, Hebrews 2 verses 14 to 18, sin and death. And, um, okay, so the victory there, and we're not, we're not going to do an exposition of Psalm 8, was given to cause the enemy and the avenger to cease. Um, and it was by the son of Adam. And we've got a whole lot of quotes there, and I don't think we've got actual time to go through those. They're a little bit of a repetition of what we've already done, so we'll move on to the next slide. Uh, uh, oh, yeah. Okay, so... With, this is a repeat, God created Adam to have all things, victory over death by the sun. The play on words man is interesting, and this is a bit of a side. Psalm 8 and Psalm 144 were both Psalms of David, both written to commemorate his victory over the life. And the interesting thing, you'll find the phrase in both Psalms, what is man that thou art mindful of him, or the son of man that thou visitest him? But if you do a study of the words that he used there, the different words that he used in Psalm 100, there's three words for man essentially in the Old Testament. There's Adam, there's Enosh, which means people of a name or men of renown, and there's, sorry, Enosh, Ish is the men of renown. Enosh is weak, sickly, mortal, frail man. So it's interesting that when you look at it, in Psalm 144, unlike Psalm 8, Psalm 8 is what is Adam that thou art uh, uh, mindful of him, or the son of, uh, sorry, son of Adam that thou visitest him. Sorry, the first word is Enosh, the second word is Adam. When you come to Psalm 144, he says, What is man that thou takest knowledge of him, or the son of man that thou takest? Man is like unto vanity, his days are like to a shadow. And what um, that word is, the root word the same as Abel or Hebel used in Genesis chapter 3. But what this is saying is that he stood before David a Colossus. And what did David see? He said he sees a weak, mortal, frail, dying man that would soon be under his feet. Was David confident? Yes, he was. Was he confident in himself? No, he wasn't. He was confident that this blasphemer of God's name would be laid low in the dust and have his head severed from his body because he believed in the living God. So if you go back to 1 Samuel 17, we're not going yet. We're not doing a study of that. Twice you'll find David speaking to Saul about the living God. 
He said, this uncircumcised Philistine is just going to be... And the, the Philistine says, I'm going to give your flesh to the fowls of the heaven. And David says, ah, the fowls of the heaven will be under the feet of the Son of Man. He will have dominion over all things. You, your flesh will be going to the Son of to the fowls because you will be under my feet. So David stood on him, picked up the last sword and chopped off his head. So when you read Psalm 8, go back to 1 Samuel 17 and read it in conjunction with that because it was written at that time. And read Psalm 144 at the same time. Anyway, uh, let's move on. Okay. So, yeah. Do you believe then, as David writes this, yep. that he's got Jesus in mind? Yes. <laughs> Why? So what did he do with the head of Goliath? He carried it up to Jerusalem, which was a Jebusite city. You see, we read 2 Samuel 23, and he says, the spirit of the God of Israel spoke through me. He says, I acted in inspiration. He cut that head off that giant and took it to the city where the giant would be slain. Jesus upon his cross slew that giant. And what was the place where Jesus was crucified? Golgotha. The place of a skull, and some suggest that it means the skull of Goliath. So he, he, by inspiration, obviously, but he writes as though it has already happened. That's correct. Yeah, it? it is. Yeah, look, the spirit of Christ that was in the prophets, and David was one of the foremost of those prophets. What percentage of the Old Testament did David write? Quite a bit. But, um, That's not a percentage. <laughs> no, but, the, but you, no, you're quite right. That's I asked you the question. I didn't have to answer it. <laughs> you see? I'm not trying, trying to be too smart. <laughs> anyway, let's go. Uh, next one. Okay. Now, we, we come to the next thing. When Adam was asked to name all the animals in Genesis chapter 2, part before him passed Mr. and Mrs. Hari, the lions. Okay, the call of the lion. Before him passed Mr. and Mrs. Cockatoo, or whatever, I don't know, the birds. And every one of them, the Hebrew says, the man and his wife, Ish and Isha. Okay? And how did Adam feel? Uh, and he named them all then. And how did Adam feel? Lonely. Intensely lonely. So what does God do? He puts Adam to sleep, the first case of anesthesia in the Bible. And he takes from his side a rib, and out of it he makes woman. And this is very different because all of the other animals, the male and the female, were created from where? Oh. Dust of the ground, just like Adam himself was. Why did he take, why didn't he create for Adam a bride the same as he did for each of the other animal creation? I'm throwing it back to you. So she could be morally and intellectually sympathetic with the glory of man, the glory of God. That's correct. And it was important as a part of Adam understanding this that he felt intense loneliness, right? He felt alone. And he needed a companion, and so God made an help suited for him. The word meet means a suitable companion. Now, Paul tells us in Ephesians chapter 5, and we're not going to turn there, he said, this is a great mystery, but I'm speaking about Christ and his ecclesia, his bride. So when the Lord Jesus Christ was crucified, he was pierced in his side through the ribs, and out came blood and water, the symbols of the ecclesia. Um, we don't know whether Adam... The scriptures don't tell us whether a scar was left or it was perfectly stitched up or anything else like that. And to make any assumption would be wrong, but Adam would have known where his bride came from. This is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. And so we are with the Lord Jesus Christ when we when we are baptised and, and day by day we become more like Christ and less like ourselves if we're walking after the Spirit, don't we? We become bone of his bone and flesh of his flesh. 
right? So Adam, again, is showing us what Christ would do. He is the figure of him that was to come. Um, now, all right, I'll put in a conjecture here. When Eve sinned and took of the fruit of the tree that she was forbidden to partake of, Adam had a, a big dilemma ahead of him, didn't he? Was he going to join her and die or was he going to do as God said? Now, we cannot know exactly what Adam, because the scriptures doesn't reveal it to us. But let me suggest that Adam was so much in love with Eve, maybe he was wrong because he certainly should have done as God said. There's no question about that. But he was prepared to enter into her distress and dilemma. Perhaps his intention was to try and save her and himself. And, and we know that God typically made a way of salvation for both of them. Will Adam be in the kingdom? It's a good question, isn't it? Um, we don't know. It doesn't say for certain. I tend to think he will be. He certainly gave a statement of faith. He did. By naming his wife Eve instead of... Yeah, half of the mother of all living. All life would come out of her. And I tend to think that Adam perhaps will be because um, it's in the next generation that we get the evil of it. Yes, Adam did wrong. He was disobedient. Back by one man, we read it in Romans 5. He was wrong. What was his motive? We don't know. But I would suggest to you that his motive was probably to try and help his help me out of the dilemma that, that had now been created in the world. Now, if I could throw in some jokes, and I hope you wouldn't want to be take me as not serious because I'm doing so, we know that the problem wasn't the apple on the tree. It was the pear on the ground, wasn't it? And I don't mean the fruit pear. I mean Adam and Eve were the pear on the ground that caused the problem. And as for the serpent, well, Adam blamed Eve, Eve blamed the serpent, and the serpent didn't have a leg to stand on, did he? <laughs> we don't know. Sorry. Well, we do know after that that he didn't because he was cursed to go on his belly. I think we should leave, leave it there. Hmm? I think we should leave it there. I think we should leave it there, absolutely. And, of course, Adam wasn't, they weren't able to solve the, the dilemma, were they? They sowed a fig leaves and to try and make aprons to cover their nakedness. That wasn't possible. Because their nakedness was covered by God. And what did God use to cover their nakedness? Land. We even know the animal, the lamb that was slain from the foundation of the world. Revelation 13. So God it says in Genesis 3 that they were clothed in the skin of an animal. But it says in Revelation 13 that it was a lamb. And how appropriate that tonight is Passover. Was we remember Passover blood, and we could, if we wanted to, I don't know, sing that hymn. Passover blood is defending God's own, because we are clothed in the skin of the Lamb when we're baptized, and the blood of Christ covers our sins, and we've made our robes white, and we've washed them in the blood of the Lamb. Revelation chapter seven, and you know, there's so many passages that we could go through. Now, so the next chapter goes into the, the promise, well, Genesis 3, the promise that God made to the serpent. He said, uh, who can quote Genesis 3.15? I will put enmity between thee and the woman. Yep. Between thy seed and her seed. Yep. It shall bruise thy head. And thou shalt bruise his seed. Okay, so it was said to the snake, and what was promised to the snake was destruction because, uh, well, we, again, well, because he became the symbol of the enmity that was created in antipathy within us and those that think after the flesh are said to think after the serpent, aren't they? And temporarily Eve had forgotten what God had said and listened to the serpent voice. However, 
The promise was not through deliverance through the seed of the man, but through the seed of the woman. Now, biologically, that doesn't make any sense because biologically, seed comes from a man. The odour comes from the woman. What God was promising was that the, the son who would deliver would be his own son, born of a virgin. Right? That is, you've all been taught that as you've gone through baptism. That's what it was about. The very first promise was about God's son being born. And th th now we we'll might have a look at Galatians. Oh, well, let's for it. We'll go to these other ones. Second, we won't go there. Second Samuel 7, verse 14. Let me quote that. I will be his father and he shall be my son. <laughs> all right, you'll be the son of God. Luke 1, verses 30 to 35. You don't have to quote all of it, but you can give me the gist of it. Angel said unto Mary, The Holy Spirit shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore, that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. How shall it be, seeing I know not a man, says Mary? Okay, it's a seed of the woman. Galatians 4, verses 4 to 5. In the fullness of time, God sent forth his Son, made of a woman, made under the law. You know, it. It, the, that promise is right throughout the scriptures also. Galatians 3, seeds not of many but one, Christ. That's yeah. right. Yeah. Yeah. So what we're finding is the thread and the parable and the pattern is all there in the early chapters of Genesis. Genesis is called the seedbed of the scriptures. And here the parable of salvation is, is played out and prefigured in Adam and his wife. Okay, now uh, first Timothy 2 verse 15. If our next reader could read that, notwithstanding, she shall be saved in childbearing if they continue in faith and charity and holiness with sobriety. Okay, the Greek is the childbearing there. Which child? Hebrew women all hoped that they would be the mother of the promised seed. They still do today. And they still do today, not realising that that lot was granted to Mary by God. The handmaiden of the Lord, be it unto me according to thy word. Just Anyway, um, now we're not going to go to Genesis 1, verses 21 and 4, verse 1, and 25 and 26, but let's say the firstborn after transgression was Cain, which means gotten or acquired. And Jesus tells us that he was of the evil one. It would seem that Cain was conceived as a result of Adam and Eve's transgression. They noticed that they were naked and they had to cover their nakedness because they were so intensely lusting after one another, to use the expression, that Cain was acquired as a result of the transgression. The second one was... Abel or Hebel, meaning a vanity, as man is, because in Adam all die. We are all Hebel. But then in verses 25 and 26, after the story of Cain and Abel, Seth, meaning appointed, God's appointed a seed. And, that, and it says, after the birth of Seth, men began to call upon the name of Yahweh when they realised their true state. So Christ is, is parabolically portrayed in both Abel and in Seth, and Cain is portrayed as the seed of the serpent. Where did he slay his brother? Because his own deeds were evil and his brothers were good. So again, you go to Genesis 4, 5, and 6, the story of the upcoming of the flood. When the sons of God saw the daughters of men, we had two distinct lines, those that were trying to walk in the ways of God and those that were following after the flesh. Story of Genesis 4, you've got the story of the first bigamist in the world, Lamech. And he invented all sorts of pleasures and he was boastful. And he says, look, if Cain, God would have marked upon Cain, and if Cain's going to be avenged sevenfold, well, Lamech's going to be avenged 70 and sevenfold. Right? And of course, the counterpart to that in the New Testament, the Lord Jesus Christ says in Matthew 18, 
I don't say that you forgive seven times. You forgive 70 times seven, and he's alluding to the boastfulness of, uh, whoops, end of slideshow. Is that the end of slideshow? Well, that's the end of the slideshow. <laughs> and I think I've spoken for about roughly 40 minutes. But um, I just, anyway, I hope I've given you something to think about. And God willing, in the next class, we're going to deal with Enoch, made like under the Son of God, Enoch. And God willing, in the last class in this series, we'll look at Melchizedek, where we started Hebrews 7, verse 3, made like under the Son of God. And we had a fairly long introduction with the Go on in your own time, look at Psalm 40 and look at Hebrews 10, look at the differences between the words, look at Psalm 8, look at Psalm 144, and I'll, I'm going to leave it there.